So, yeah, I'm Tom Boyle. I'm head of telecoms at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals. Um, I'll go through the key themes in a minute. I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I arrived at what I do now. I'm acutely conscious that I don't look like the traditional head of telecoms that works in the public sector. Um, I've been there 10 years now, so that means I started when I was about 14, so that's roughly how long I've worked in the NHS. Um, I had a bit of a non-standard sort of standard journey into the NHS, in all honesty. Um, I originally, at university, did sports science. I was interested in analytics. That was the way I wanted to go. I did that as an undergraduate degree. I then moved into working in professional sport. I worked for Chesterfield, Scunthorpe United, a few different football clubs, West Bromwich Albion. I um, was working at Scunthorpe at the time. The first time I was Alan Neil got sacked. I lost my job. I couldn't pay my mortgage. I needed a job. So I ended up working as a Bantu and, uh, in a Bantu analytical role in healthcare, I worked in drug services. And that was the sort of a start of a journey that's taken me through a plethora of different analytical roles. I worked in community services, district nursing, and then moved into IT. The first interaction I had with Ian when I was installing some VoIP phones. That was my first real sort of involvement in telephony, in all honesty, that was only five years ago. Um, I then was the telecoms manager, head of telecoms now. Um, a vast network that we've got that's probably very, very different to anything that a lot of people have got in the private sector. So I'll, I'll touch on that later. So there's a little bit about me not that interesting. Uh, the things I was going to cover, in all honesty, were what is shaping our strategy at STA, so what's the sort of things that we're looking at and what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, the changing ask on us as telecom. So I touched on this when I was speaking to Louise, uh, Louise in all honesty, is that my job sort of five or six years ago and Ian's job in the past before then was very much telephone, switchboard and that sort of thing. And it's very much evolving now as to probably a point where I'd imagine in the next couple of years, telecoms isn't going to be in my job title. It's not going to be a thing that we do anymore. It's going to be much wider than that. Uh, beyond then, I'll touch on the Tiger implementation. That'll be useful because that's the point of the day. Um, <laughs> the, benefits of, the benefits of prison for us. Um, so, again, a whole host of reasons that I'll go through. The, the incumbent that we had at the time was very much just sending us data. We weren't doing anything that exciting with it. Um, for uh, the, the last, uh, sorry, the second to last one, looking outside of the NHS and outside of the UK, so I'm, again, acutely conscious that there is an impression that in the NHS we're very much behind the curve, and I think as an organisation we're probably a little bit behind that curve. We don't, and I don't necessarily want it to look like that. I want us to be as good as it gets when it comes to voice. I want us to really be up there and do really exciting things, as exciting as, as telecoms can get, in all honesty. I know that's not that exciting, but I find it interesting. Uh, and then the next three to five years at SCH, so what we're doing, what we're wanting to do, um, different sort of things there, really. But again, like I touched on, the, uh, the change in ask, really, is that... It's, it's, it's not just voice products anymore. Um, again, I'll come to the, the slide that shows our network. So what is shaping our strategy in all honesty? So the big one for us is the PST and switch off. We've got a massive copper network. We've got 15,000 DDI, 12,000 extensions. We've got 4,500 bleeps. Um, I know a lot of people don't realise what a bleep is even these days. We've got so many pages, long range pages, you name it. So the PSTN switch off for us and, and moving from um, ISDN and then moving to SIP is it's a massive undertaking for us. It's a complete change of how we work. It's a complete change of how my traditional copper engineers work. A, a call going out of a data circuit is alien to them. They don't understand it. I wouldn't lie and say that I would have understood it three or four years ago. So that's a big thing that's sort of we're focusing on at the moment. We're nearly there. We're working with Gamma, so we're moving to Gamma from uh, BT, Vodafone and Virgin Media Business. It's, it's a massive undertaking for a hospital, especially with the risk that's associated with a call that comes in. Um, I suppose moving on from them is that it's the intersection that we've been at as well that's shaping our strategy is when I first started, IP was very new to us. We only have IP phones in our community sites, so I think we've got about five or six hundred across Ian, how many community sites have we got now? 30, 25, a lot, a lot across the city, some in Barnsley, some out beyond there. Um, so at the time, we only really moved to IP because we were forced. It wasn't something that we would have chose to do, I'm sure they will agree. Um, and then it's beyond then and over the years of COVID, it's, it's what we do and why we do it. Should we go full IP? Have we got the network equipment even in place? I mean, I know for a fact that we don't even have Power River Ethernet on 70% of our network switches, so we can't do it. 
I think five or six years ago, we'd have never looked at a hosted voice solution. Would we have ever considered integrating into UC? Probably not. If COVID never happened, we'd have probably still been using Office Communicator 2007. So um, I suppose stepping a bit away from that is it's the ever-changing ask and the ever-changing plan. So again, what I was saying is the stuff that we were being asked for a few years ago was to move a telephone, uh, can I have a bleep? That was fine. I suppose thinking analytically is, did this call happen or did this bleep go out? And we could, we could prove it or otherwise, but we couldn't really put any firm basis behind that and say it definitely happened because it was, it, there was no real point of, of proving it. So if you send a WhatsApp, you get a tick or you get a double tick. We couldn't say that that call definitely happened. The switch might have seen that it was placed, but did it go anywhere? We don't know. So that brings me to what our network used to look like. So this was 2000 and... This is this was Ian's network. Blame Ian. Uh, this was two thousand and probably up until two thousand and fifteen. In all honesty, is we had uh, four Siemens ISDXs across two different parts of the city. There's a whole host of things here that a lot of people won't even recognise on a private sort of uh, switch environment. So we've got a bleep system. I mean, I don't know if anyone here even has a bleep network or. Knows what I mean when I say, no, I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> we've got links to the university, we've, we've got a whole host of things that, it was, it was messy, it was connected up via a plethora of different ways. We had a lot of different products from um, Netcall up here. We had a mobile gateway that only sent calls out on a box full of SIM cards. That's where we were up to a few years ago. <laughs> Stepping forward from then is where we're up to at the moment. So again, I don't think people realise the complexity of what it looks like in NHS and the sort of thing that we're doing. I think they think that healthcare is the main thing. Whereas in reality, in this day and age, every company is a tech company. And we're as much a tech company as anyone else. And we are really trying to make it look like that. So there's a whole host of different things that we've got connected here. This is all ISDM. Uh, we've got links out here, there and everywhere. But like I say, we've got consoles in switchboard that don't even they don't even have a video port that support, supports a separate monitor that's sort of that's what it looks like in the public sector not to put it down but that's what we're fighting against so where we're going to be in a few years i hope so when our transition to sip happens we've got our tiger platform that it doesn't actually link up there but that's our first sort of jump into cloud we've never done anything cloud in our lives i think if i said cloud to me when i first started five or six years ago, we'd go, yes. We looked out the window. Yeah. <laughs> that was a joke I should do, mate. Um, we'd, we'd like to do some that, some exciting stuff as well. We're putting everything in the cloud. And we, want, we want to back all the risk off to everyone else. We don't, we don't want to worry about, we want to know that the calls get placed, we can report on them, and then we can focus on doing the sort of the core of the business, the doctors, the nurses, delivering the care. So it uh, moves on to what's shaping our strategy. I've already done this. There we go. Um, so I suppose uh, after all of that and all that legacy sort of stuff we've got, we've got obviously this massive market disruption that we had, where 2019, I still think it's last year, but it's not. So obviously COVID happened and Teams. I don't know about anyone else. I don't know what it's like in the private sector, but I thought that Teams was another um, office communicator, a link, a Skype for business. I genuinely did not think that it would take off how it has. And I still can't believe it now. I, I thought that we'd never go beyond sort of the initial contract that we had with NHS England, we had, we've got a national contract that I'll come to, that's a pain for us. So that was that with teams. I think COVID for us in healthcare really sort of forced our hand and it made us act overnight. In the past, if we wanted to do something, if I took a new way of working to E&E &E and takes it to our board and to our um, directors, there's so many steps and so much red tape in healthcare to get something done. Whereas I think, and I might be wrong in the private sector, is if I come to you and say, I want to do this, it saves money, I'd expect to be said, why haven't you done it already? And we don't really have that sort of environment. So I think COVID made us do things quickly. There was money available that we're probably all paying back in tax now. And so that, that's what happened with COVID in all honesty, is it meant that we could do a lot more a lot quicker. And it gave us, I think it also on the flip side, it gave the business this understanding that Actually, IT is core to what we do, and we really ought to place a bit more reliance on it than instead of it being sort of a bottom line on a spreadsheet and it, it's a cost, it, it's not. It's something that sort of underpins everything that we do. 
Um, a stepping away from that other legacy technology, I've touched on the whole host of different things that we've got. So we've got 4,000 bleeps. We've got long range pages still. Again, I don't, does anyone know what a long range page is? I'm sure you do, but I'm looking for nods. <laughs> There's a lot of blanks there. It's a page with a SIM card in it. It's pointless. There's, I hate it. <laughs> um, it, is, it is, in this day and age, though, it is bizarre is that we hold on to these long range pages and the staff do because they must be contacted off-site and away from the hospital. Yet, they don't get back to anyone. They don't ring back. They complain that there's not instant voice communication. Well, a phone can have a SIM card in it. It does the same thing. And it's cheaper. <laughs> a little anecdote on that is that someone brought me a bleep back a while ago. A doctor brought it back and said to me, it's not. I've not had anything from it for years. You can finally have it back. And it had the old BT logo on it with the chap with the trumpet. Or I don't know what that was. And it hadn't been in service for 10 years. And I said, that's probably the reason you've not received any bleep. So. Still being carried around with it. Yeah, yeah diligently. Hot <laughs> noob. Yeah, noob. There was brand new batteries in it. It was fantastic. Did you reuse them? It's on my desk at work. Um, yeah. uh, so I think everything encompassing that and what's really shaping our strategy is being able to report on what we do. So I think this comes to Ian more than it comes to me, but I, I think our sort of senior management team in IT, they want to know, they know that there's a telecoms team there and they know that there's a function that's served. They don't hear a lot about what the guys do because it sort of goes, it goes away and they just do it silently. Phones get fixed, phones work. And for us, it's really about centralising all the data from all the platforms that we've got so that we can prove that we are busy, we are doing a lot of work. People rely on a good old telephone still, they still need it. And then especially with the, um, with the uh, rollout of Teams is that we want to show how many calls are taking place in Teams, what people are using Teams for. So that was, the, that was what I want to touch on, on the centralisation of data. Um, the change in ask is, is really about what the expectation of, I suppose, IT wider and also us as telecoms is. So we were starting to see after COVID consultation, uh, consultations via Teams, Attend Anywhere was a centralised NHS England contract that they awarded that was this fantastic app that meant that patients could speak to doctors on a video call. I think it was affectionately known as DNA Anywhere because no one knew how to connect to it. I don't think they appreciated that people didn't have a, especially the demographic that they assume that healthcare faces is, it's what we get a lot is that it's all elderly people. The only people that, that come to NHS services is all elderly people. But the data off the back of it was that it never worked, it never functioned, and they defaulted to a telephone again. So that was something different that we got asked to do. Um, didn't, <laughs> amusingly, is when we had Attend Anywhere, is that it was the new platform that you connected up to, IP address, you name it, is we were asked if we could connect the telephony into it and can you dial into it. Well, there's no point in having Attend Anywhere then for us. You just, you, you ring someone, I, don't, I didn't, didn't see the point of that. So that was, that was some excitement that we had. Um, I suppose for a traditional hospital, we also have the importance still of, I know this is changing, but this doesn't really, is that there's an expectation that a hospital has a presence and someone that can answer a phone. I think if it was six months time, I'd, I would like to take that out, because I would very much like the trust, and I was speaking to him recently about it, so I would like to be able to contact the trust in different ways. I want there to be a choice to contact the organisation. Can you come on our website and do a live chat, can you ask for a number, basic stuff, or can you book a whole appointment or rebook it, cancel it online? I don't think we're going to be there anytime soon, but there's always this sort of importance of an inbound call presence and a switchboard. And I'm sure that apart from the post office and Royal Mail and BT, a lot of organisations don't have a service called a switchboard. So that was that was the one that we were, we were looking at there. Um, Oversaturization, underutilization. I suppose at the start of COVID, is we saw a load of people wholesale shift off site. How do we do that? How do we enable that to happen? Um, Teams was obviously the answer to that at the time, and I'll come on to later about what we want to do with Teams and the voice platform. Underutilization is is sort of where we're at now. Is I have this overview of the the network that there's only forty percent of the phones, fifty percent of the phones that are in use yet. Yeah our SIP channel capacity and our ISDN capacity is absolutely maxed out. So if we went, if we took all of the usage that we've got now and took it back three or four years, we'd be in a complete pickle. Without sort of the product set that we've got from TAG, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know that. We might have a report that's in three days time that tells us it, but there was no reaction that we could do. 
Um, procurement and funding of new products and services. So buying anything in the NHS is just chaos. We, we have all these frameworks that we can buy off of and that's the due diligence that should happen and we should be able to procure directly on them. We should be able to direct, direct award, but it's never enough. And I suppose that groups with, I think, another one I've got further down is that there's this understanding with our sort of target audience that's our colleagues and our staff members that they know that IT underpins everything that we do now. They want us to do things that are new. They want us to evolve. They want us to change. But it's impossible to buy it. it if I wanted to buy anything that cost over five grand, it would take months. It re really would. I'd have to have three quotes. I'd have to prove that the three quotes were genuine. I'd have to get Ian to co-sign it with me. Then someone would check in and I haven't sort of given it to our mate who has, runs a business out of a garage. And so that's, that's the difficulty that we've got there in doing anything new and exciting. Again, high customer expectation I've just touched on and everything being driven by cost and data. So this segues into sort of the Tiger piece in all honesty. Um, so touching on the Tiger implementation, I wouldn't lie, we had, a, we had a bit of a challenge I'm sure Rob will appreciate with our implementation of Tiger is You'll remember from the diagrams I showed you, we have a very, very confusing <coughs> network. Not a lot of people have five, six PBXs. Not a lot of people have them split across many sites. Not a lot of people have very many varied ways of them interconnecting. So we had a lot of, a lot of difficulties with interpreting the data. We knew what was happening. It wasn't necessarily being shown there. But we have got there, we've got there, and it's been, it's been great. But this is, this is where we were, we were at originally. So our incumbent, um, we had a great relationship with them, don't get me wrong, but it was very much that they got a CSV file via FTP from our, our PBXs and they kept it, they made it look nice, and then we asked for a report on it. That was, as, that was as exciting as it got. In all honesty, if I had the time, I could have dumped it all into SQL and done something exciting ourselves, and it would have probably been cheaper. I think I do remember it saying to Ian, why don't we do this? And he said, well, if you've got the time to do it, then great, but we never did. Um, this was, you know, like this. This is this is where we were up to until a few years ago. Is this is our trafficometer. So once a month, we would dump a CSV file into this access database that Andrew, my former senior engineer, Ian's former senior engineer, we made it together. And it basically, we type a number and it tells us the node. It tells us how many calls it's got. That was our call login. That was it. If I double clicked on a cell, it'd give me a report. Did this call happen? Yes. Did it happen? No. That was that was the crux of it. We obviously wanted a lot more than that. And we needed we needed to see the network as a whole. We needed to see what was really happening. And, and we couldn't. And we found more and more, especially because our transition over to Tiger happened sort of... It started before COVID. It was mid-COVID by the time we got there. Is that services were coming to us and saying, oh, are we taking this many calls? Do we need to move to a contact centre way of working? And I couldn't really hang my hat on this data. It was a, a 80% best guess. This was how much capacity we've got. This is the demand. That was where we were at up until we moved to Tiger. And, and in all honesty, like I said, we had the challenges, but we can see a lot more of a higher level picture now. I can see ISDN trunk allocation. I'll be able to see SIP capacity soon. And that means that we can react to what we're doing instead of asking for a report, waiting three days, if it's out of hours, it'll be the day after. And it was it was really difficult to run a hospital so a hospital at all. Um, I think off the back of that, and obviously talking about everything that data encompasses, is I think I don't think it's widely well, I don't think it's widely happens at all, but there's so much work that we're trying to do. I'll just put these all up on the screen. There's so much work that we're trying to do and trying to learn from outside of the NHS, because I'm very conscious that uh, I might be wrong, everyone can tell me, is that there's an impression that this is the way that tech works in the NHS. It's, it's, it's 20, 50, 15, 20 years ago. If you came onto our hospital site and walked into our contact centres, they're, they're call centres, they're from the 90s, they're not contact centres. There is, there is a way that we work that's historically happened that up until probably COVID would probably still be happening. And there's so much else that's, that's happening now in the wider industry that we want to get a steer on. We want to interface with teams and, and other platforms that we've got. We want to be, I mean, in an ideal world, we'd probably sell off the PBXs and we'd have teams as our, as our sort of avenue of choice for calls. That would be a lot easier for us to manage. All of our engineers, they've had a career at BT. They've retired once. They want to retire again soon. Are we going to go and find another fantastic PBX engineer that can, that's quite happy to go and tap out 
uh, DPs? Probably not. No one finishes school now and goes to BT and starts a career in telephony. So the way the industry is evolving is it means that we need to evolve alongside it. And I don't think that's happened for 20 years in the NHS. Um, cloud, obviously, is, is something that we want to do. I think that outside of the NHS, I think cloud only is probably the, the, the steer that, I'd, that you'd want to put in place. I don't see any point in us these days going and buying boxes of tin and then putting them in our data centres and then we're reliant on estates to keep the room cool. They, they don't keep the room cool. We're reliant on IT colleagues to go and check it, check the lights are still flashing, check it still works. I want to know that I ring one company and say, are our product sets working? Yeah, great. Don't have to worry about it. I can focus on what we want to do, which is do all these exciting development pieces. Um, blockchain, this is probably something a bit, a, bit, a bit sort of advanced for us as a healthcare organisation, but there's probably a point in time that blockchain replaces the need for us to have SBCs. There's probably a point in time where all of our sick traffic, and I'm probably... Uh, appreciate if I'm getting a bit too excited and technical, I do apologise, but there's going to come a time where that happens. Calls can authenticate on a wider level and they'll know that this number goes to Sheffield Teaching Hospitals, this number goes somewhere else. There's no need to have that box of tin in the middle. I think beyond that and outside of what I look after in my room at the moment, there's probably going to come a time thinking of sort of wider uh, sort of patient data there's probably a time when you're going to monetize your data as a patient you're probably going to say i'm quite happy to be involved in this survey but my data sits on the blockchain and i want a quid every time you go to it that's probably a world we're going to evolve to whether it happens in private healthcare in the u.s first yes probably it's probably it's going to come at some point and um, what we want to do at sth i'll throw them up on the screen again but and i touched on it earlier but we would like to integrate everything into teams we're going to keep the analog network there that's always going to be the 60% of our phones are wall phones, they're ward phones. That's all we need. We don't need a £120 VoIP handset. We need a copper line to our PBX, breaks out to SIP, it does the job that it needs to do. All our resilience is there from our SIP provider. But we're sort of strangled at the moment by this NHS England contract that we've got, this central tenant, is we've got no administrative control over it. We can't really start to have teams as this ultimate UC that we see it as. I think if we get it in front of our board and they know that you can work at home one day, your calls come through teams, they go to your phone, you name it, there's no way we're going to work back from that. And I'd imagine that that's what's happening everywhere else, in all honesty. Uh, chatbots and automation are a given. We don't use anything like this at all, but we have services like estates that you call them up and say, I've got a fault. But there's no one there to take the call. But when you get through to them, they just log the fault on a platform that you can access yourself. There's absolutely no need for anyone to be involved in that process. It, it's 25 grand a year for a member of staff. If they're, I don't know, starting out in their career, you're going to pay it for 50 years. You pay five grand and we can automate the whole process. It's, it's bizarre that we even do things like that these days. Uh, network level controls on our SIP network. So by that, I mean that there was never a point in the past where if we lost a block of DDI on our ISDN, we'd be screwed. Now we can sort of send them straight to mobile, send them off the network, that sort of thing. Bleep replacement, I've touched on bleeps already, is that we want to move to a clinical messaging platform because junior doctors use WhatsApp. It's not secure. They need a platform. They've forever said to Ian before me that we want to do something better than bleeps, but there's never been anything that we can guarantee the penetration of the signal. We own the radio frequencies. So that's a direction that we want to go in. I think we'll be there next year. <laughs> and then uh, I suppose beyond then, the thing that's really gonna change our work is this ICS and ICB central service offering. So an ICS is our integrated care something or other. It's, the, it's, it's something that looks after the region, the way we work. ICB is integrated care boards. There's going to come a time whereby we're going to centralise everything as, 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 a, as a healthcare offering. I don't, either that or it gets privatised under this government, but I like it too political. <laughs> It'll trickle down slowly. Um, that's, that's going to change how we work. We've got GP practices that aren't part of our trust, but they're part of the CCG, and they've got many and very different ways of working. And there is going to come a point in time whereby, and Tiger is an example, if we're going to go whole hog, as an ICB using one platform, we ought to do it all together. We ought to be using the same platform. I ought to be able to get call data from Rotherham, from Barnsley. Th there's no reason why we're all working differently. We're not, I suppose in the private sector, you're up against other companies. You probably wouldn't ring your competitor and ask for advice, but 
I'm not I'm not challenging anyone. I don't there's no need for me to ring Rotherham and ask them what they're doing and want to better them. Let's work together. So that's sort of the central offering thing that I wanted to touch on. That in effect is a whistle stop tour. Um I've flown through that, sorry, it's been a very long day. I've had one beer in a Wellington. Um if anyone's got any questions, then feel free to fire them away. If not, that's me. Stay exactly where you are for a second. Go on, questions. When you're moving to sit, Tom? Um, we're in the midst of moving to sit now. Um, we've got the sit build in place. Uh, we're going to, I think Vodafone are booting us off of their ICM platform at the end of this month. So we're going to transition half of our DDI at one campus to, Vo to Gamma, and then we'll slowly do the rest. It's going to be a big change for us, in all honesty, but um, a change that it needs to happen. We're, we're ready for it. And if, we, if we've done way in advance of 2025, then we can start to work on these more exciting things that we really want to do. Just your comment, you know, the general consensus is you've already been here for Ireland. Yeah. I think that comes down to the, the people at the top. Well, how are you going to change them? So that they will start backing what you Yeah, no, I, I think it's difficult for me to say because in the grand scheme of things, I'm quite junior in the, in the hierarchy of the NHS Trust. But I think until we get a CIO on our board, I don't think a great deal is going to change at that level. We're always going to have a finance director set up there. They're going to see IT as a cost. It's not something that they're going to invest in. I think it's slowly happening. I think a lot of trusts are starting to see uh, sort of C-suite level staff that come from informatics. So not a, a director of informatics or a director of IT that traditionally is there. Because it seems bizarre that they have these conversations at board level about IT and not involve anyone from IT. So I think once that happens, maybe we'll start to see a change. That's, that's, that's the hope anyway. I hope, I hope that's the case because that's the direction I'd want to go in. Otherwise, there's going to be a ceiling that I'm never going to go up. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you're in Uh, I think the biggest thing that helps with now, in all honesty, is it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily giving data to the services for them to build on. It's for, for looking at faults. It's, it's a pain in the arse to go into our PBXs or an ammo command that's in German and see what stages of the calls have happened. We jump on Tiger, it's there sort of live, pretty much. We can see if it hit the trunk, what happened beyond the trunk. Was it part of a, a hunt group? Uh, is that why the call went off somewhere else? Because our faults are really low level. My phone did not ring when someone rang it. But the difficulty that the guys have in ascertaining what went wrong is, is crazy. It's unbelievable. So that's how it's really helped us day to day, is that we can really pin down what's happening, where the calls are going, and, and fix it as soon as possible, and then get back to day-to-day -day sort of shifting cables about that sort of exciting stuff. And of course the really important thing from your perspective is the ramifications of a call failing. It, it's bad in any business, in you know, the finance industry, in, in large corporate, it's, it's a missed business opportunity. <coughs> this is the NHS, it's not a business opportunity, it's not no. a missed no, and situation, it's a, a life and death. The, the example that we've got of that in all honesty is we've got a phone in ED that's called the red phone. It is actually yeah. red. And if that phone fails and uh, Yaz, Yorkshire Ambulance Service, can't get through to say someone's turned up with major trauma, is we get it in the net. It's our fault, our personal fault. And we need, to be, we need to be reactive. We need to fix it straight away. We need to reroute calls within a second. And if I can see that there's a link down, I can send my phone somewhere else. No one even knows what's happened, and that's that's how we want to work. A silent honestly. hero. I think the way that someone explained it to me once was wetting yourself in dark trousers. You can't see it. <laughs> I might have got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, On that note, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're not off yet. You're not off yet, Kevin. You had. So I work in the NHS. We're three foot really behind. We're way behind us. So. We know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it sounds good. We use bleeps, we've gone, just gone full IT, we've gone up across it. And it, what you said earlier is you do need somebody on your board yeah. that's going to back it. We've yeah. been quite lucky up. We've got the CIO, CEO level. Yeah. And they realise that digital, if we actually come into the IT department, I don't know how you do that. Yeah, we're part of IT, yeah. More, more the so ginger haired stepchild of IT. Our yeah. hospital have now realised that digital is the way forward. I think we're getting there slowly, but I, I don't think it's going to happen any time soon. Yeah, I'd like, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll appreciate this chaos. <laughs>
But equally, what I've seen over the years, 20 odd years doing this now, is education used to be very much like this. Mm -hmm. Education, university, we've got quite a few in the room today. You can stick your hands up in a second. But I see you guys as having come over from that kind of your description, that NHS yeah. challenge mm -hmm. of IT versus comms and, and everything that's gone with that, becoming more technical, becoming more business-like, essentially, and that education sector bringing themselves up towards more of an enterprise-level agreement. And that's exactly where NHS is, is needing to go and taking itself, but it's obviously... I, don't, yeah, I, don't, I, think there's a, I think there's a misunderstanding that we don't have these aspirations yeah, to do yeah, these yeah. certain things. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be looked at like that. No. Our guys don't want to work that way, but... We're sort of mm. strangled by a certain effect, so. Get there. Get there. I think, Tom, and other financiers, I think as you try to bring your industries and your markets up up and up to the level that you want it to be, yeah. you're going to have to go there with the data, through power of the boards who may or may not have a CI on them, to prove what you're saying works, because you probably pilot something yeah. for a while somewhere within a certain area of the the hospitals are going to say, look, that works, can we roll this out now? Mm -hmm. Without that empirical data... Like, like I said, it underpins everything that we mm -hmm. do, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a buzzword for the data news today, all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. And again, touching on the idea that that adoption, that capacity planning, whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. it's not a, a roll out, check it, and then leave it for three years yeah. type environment. And that's for everyone in this room it's not just about what's today what's tomorrow look like it's about constantly checking in on what has changed dynamics of the world your organization your business focus your business strategy it has an impact on that and that's really important for you guys i think the other dynamic you're going to find as well is it's the dichotomy you've got between having to spend money to save money mm. in, in a sector like yours it's very hard to spend money because yeah. you don't have money to spend but you can't move forward unless you spend it. Yeah. It's actually proving the saving by spending X to save Y. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the difficulty we've and got. That's the difficulty I can see you've got, yeah. We're forever waiting to be pushed instead yeah. of jumping first. Yeah. God bless that data. Tom, thank you so thank much. You. I really appreciate it. Yeah.